Eurogamer Game Journo and ideologue Ed Nightingale made a post titled Persona 4 Golden Has Not Aged Well, Kanji, Misogyny, and Representation. From a title like that, you can already guess this guy's beliefs. Let's see. Comments were disabled on the post. Eurogamer's Twitter post got ratioed. I got blocked from said post. Ed's Twitter page showcases his pronouns, and of course, his Twitter feed is protected. Well, I guess we can't have different contrary opinions. This is stuff you'd expect from Kotaku. But, okay, Ed, let's see what you got. With its outdated stereotypes and dialogue filled with misogyny and homophobia, P4G has not aged well. I really enjoyed the original and golden, and I don't recall misogyny or homophobia. And in the woke world, anything typically older than a year has outdated stereotypes, so that's not a problem. This is an opportunity to reflect on the past and appreciate how far representation in games has come. Or we cannot give a crap about representation in the first place of a Japanese game company making a game for Japanese players about a Japanese countryside town and simply enjoy the game for what it's worth. A high school drama sim with a murder subplot in a supernatural setting. It's the poor representation that has truly soured my time with the game, however. P4G is rife with misogyny. Persona 4 Golden is a huge game. You have to be a nitpicking ideologue hunting for these things, taking things out of context, which makes mountains out of molehills. And let's say there is misogyny. Okay, how is that bad? In a story about murders and discovering your true self by fighting your shadow self, hating people isn't that far off, nor is it a big deal when murder is on the line. Survival is a bit more important than social issues. Female characters exist almost always under a male gaze. And the main character is constantly under the female gaze. What's your point? Males and females in Persona 4 are attractive, and some aren't. They're designed that way. That's a shock. Totally. Ah, right. <laughs> That's a good thing. They're worth directly relating to their looks. I can't admire your body or your body. Rise was an idol model who's trying to finish her schooling. Why can't I appreciate how she looks? Naoto is from a line of detectives hiding her gender to be the best there is in a male-dominated world. Now she's trying to accept her femininity. Both are still nice to look at, but no main or secondary character in the story is reducing them to visuals. But even if they were, again, how is that bad? What's wrong with characters being attracted to visually attractive characters? Oh, I don't believe it! Even when you're ancient, you're still cool! <laughs> They're almost constantly hit on, be it by their friends or even their creepy teachers. Welcome to the world of women, sir. You mean high school kids are attracted to each other? You mean like how Chie and Yukiko and, well, everyone else in the school are checking out the new kid, you? because he's basically a prince from a big city, going to a town where not much happens. Come on, let's go! Everyone's staring. Who's nice with everyone and solves all of their major problems. agree that you seem like a pretty open guy. There's a funny air about you. I don't know. I guess that's what draws people to you or something like that. Whoa, maybe you are my type. How could she possibly develop any kind of interest in him? The two girls the hero befriends are heavily stereotyped between the quiet pretty one and the outspoken nerdy one. It's clear which is considered more desirable. That's made explicit when male friend Yosuke directly asks the player which girl he'd rather date, as if fancying at least one of them is inevitable. There's nothing wrong with this dialogue. Yosuke is a healthy young man. This is a normal conversation between guys. I gotta ask, Ed, did you have a high school life with other guys, you know, healthy young men? Or were they all just weird? And the game pretty much sets you up to be attracted to someone, to choose a lover as it is, as you go up their social link. They almost throw themselves at you. While I agree it's not inevitable, Risei is basically throwing herself at you every day. Chi and Yukiko are super into how cool you is all the time. And, well, Naoto is pretty much perfect. There's a few others, and they're all relatively dramatic, 
but they all make sense as to why they like the main character. So it's no surprise in getting to learn about these characters, you just might like them back. Storytelling. Wow. I chose neither and my character's courage increased. It does take courage to not fit societal norms, after all. Hey, not that I care, but do you really swing that way? Huh? What way? I mean, I'm not judging or anything, it's cool, but since we're sharing a tent and all, I just... Just two examples of the frequent misogyny present in dialogue. Compare this to Mr. Morouka, a voice acted in Avatar to character who actively hates everyone. He's a bad teacher, but okay, Mr. Yamada hates women because he called Yukiko a cutie in front of his class. I guess he's never had a healthy male homeroom teacher who makes people feel welcome by giving them silly introductions. Oh yeah, remember when Chie asked the player character if they think Yukiko is cute too on the first day? So tell me, you think Yukiko is cute, huh? Wow, that Chie, such soggy knees. Whoa, are you blushing? <laughs> Come on, don't start this again. She's really popular at school, but she's never had a boyfriend. Kind of weird, huh? Wow, it's like it's a theme with Yukiko. Everyone knows she's cute, even her best friend, except for her, because of her backstory. And this is all within the first hour of gameplay. Talking about best girl, she also attacks Yusuke by kicking him in the balls before even realizing he broke her DVD. She just chases after him and attacks him in their class. But yeah, I guess Ed missed that part of Chie being misandric, or maybe he understands Yusuke is just the comic relief character who sucks with girls. But it's okay when girls kick guys in the balls, but bad when a young man shares dirty jokes to his friends. Oh, and a day later, after meeting Chie, she forces herself under your umbrella. Hmm. Yeah, that's not problematic at all, is it, Ed? Yep, there's Chie dripping all over the main character. She's totally not wet at all. <laughs> that's pretty stupid. <laughs> Thanks. And the second example of misogyny, according to Ed, is that Yusuke apparently calls up Chie at midnight to tell her dirty jokes. This is a whole month after Yusuke, Yu, and Chie went into the TV world, met Teddy, and are actively investigating a murder. They call each other up at midnight due to the midnight channel because of its supernatural nature. It seems perfectly reasonable to lighten the mood when nothing happens. But apparently, because Chie is a girl, telling dirty jokes to her is misogyny. Whoa, your handwriting really sucks. I don't want to be the comic relief! Critical hit to the net. Let's try staking out both Kanji and his family's store. We definitely don't want the killer getting ahead of us. That being said, Yukiko, can I have your cell number? Hey, was this your plan all along? Uh, no, <laughs> I got everybody's phone number except for hers. And the Y section of my address book needs some filling out. <sighs> While we're on the subject, could you stop calling me at night just to tell dirty jokes? You really sound like a pervert. Hey, I'm trying to have a conversation with Yukiko here. Hmm. Oh, that reminds me. I need to buy tofu on my way home. Ooh, she didn't hear a word I said. And no one ate dinner that night. Wow, Yusuke sure is hateful to the women of the world by wanting to call up his friends with supernatural powers when said friends might be able to solve and prevent a murder. But... Let's talk about the kanji in the room. He's also gay, though not explicitly. No, he's not. His shadow acts obnoxiously gay, but kanji is not. He's just portrayed using harmful stereotypes that are at best awkward and at worst downright homophobic. Playing through his story arc is deeply uncomfortable. What do you mean the villains of a story appear harmful and awkward? What harmful stereotypes does Kanji possess outside of being a delinquent and being aggressive? Which he resolves at the end of the story, which is the point of his arc. There's nothing homophobic about gay stereotypes. Using gay stereotypes doesn't make them homophobic, especially when you're in a fantasy land 
called The Midnight Channel, where symbolic, dark, twisted ideas of your unconscious mind called shadows come to life. That you actively destroy. Hell, one of the teachers has an entire lecture about Jungian psychology, if you actually paid attention. I didn't see anything uncomfortable with Kanji or his shadow. That sounds like more of an Ed problem than a Persona 4 Golden Fan problem. But hey, Ed, we'll chalk that up as you being a work in progress. Kanji was the son of a textile shop owner. He liked cute things and made dolls growing up. As such, other kids made fun of him or didn't accept him, so he became a delinquent. His arc is to grow out of that image, accept his interests, and face his fears. He's actually a pretty likable guy, but Mr. Red the Tolerant Nightingale just can't accept this fact and sees him only as a sexual object. How ironic. And if the shadow is a literal interpretation of one's innermost character, or the truth, then Kanji is really just a flamboyantly gay man who wants to shake his ass in public bathhouses surrounded by other gay men. Rise only sees herself as Rosette and wants to be a stripper. Chie is totally jealous of Yukiko, but also thinks herself superior, wants to dominate her life, so Yukiko becomes dependent on her. Yukiko wants to get railed by a line of studs. See, I'm out to tame me a whole pack of the best studs there are. Yosuke is bored, sick of everything, feels isolated, and is absolutely terrified of being alone, which means his happy-go-lucky attitude is just a facade. Teddy is really just a hollow shadow entity with no substance and no meaning, and is ultimately a pointless existence. Naoto is just a lonely, childish girl who wants to be a cool adult male detective complete with a cartoonish sex change operation. But that would be all reductivist and miss the point of accepting your shadow self. Kanji is simply attracted to cute things, like Naoto. Naoto is just the sweet on Polly Oliver trope, where a man can see past the disguise of a woman dressed as a man. And with that trope comes all kinds of confusion. It's a common pattern in storytelling. And yet Kanji only gets nosebleeds when he looks at girls. In the anime manga video game world, nosebleeds are signs of sexual arousal. Being embarrassed and confused is not. We were talking about some pretty risque stuff in there. Sorry, Kanji. Did you get a nosebleed all over your pillow? Is Ed trying to diagnose Kanji? Kanji isn't suffering from whatever the devil internalized homophobia is. Sounds like you're projecting there, buddy. Kanji doesn't know what it means to be a man. The last thing his dad told him before he died. Dad told me something right before he died. If you're a man, you have to become strong. Felt like he was telling me I wasn't a real man. Pissed me off. So I changed my looks and pushed myself away from people. Fighting gangs, thinking I was protecting mom, trying to catch this killer. I thought all that was how I was becoming strong. That I was really making up for all the trouble I caused. I was drunk off my power. But that wasn't it. That ain't what dad meant. I still don't really get what being strong means, but I'm gonna start by not lying to myself. No more being scared of everyone, hiding my hobbies, staying away from people. People aren't that clear cut. Kanji gets accused of being a bully by students and police alike, all because of his looks. He had no friends growing up because he'd rather play house instead of catch and go to home ec instead of PE. It has nothing to do with his sexuality since he's 15. In fact, he ends up wanting to use persona powers to help the town be more peaceful. Now he's got a short temper, like when he heard his mom got sent to the hospital and he runs off embarrassed because he was so concerned about her even though she was just fine. None of this exposition has anything to do with sex, sexuality, or sexual identity. And at the end, Kanji's just afraid of being rejected as he was as a kid. He never gave people the time of day to get them to understand his side of the story, whether it be his hobbies or being accused of being a delinquent. He was just scared. Like many coming-of-age stories, it's really nothing that new. Persona. But not to Ed. To Ed, 
He thinks Naoto and Yusuke are hostile towards Kanji's sexuality. Naoto tells Kanji he seemed to be an odd person, that his expression changed and she was quite surprised, that his actions were somewhat forced and unnatural throughout the time she was with him, and that he may have some sort of complex. A complex can mean many things, and it happens later on in the story that happens to be a fear of rejection. This is all to move the plot along to contact Teddy with this info. Again, nothing to do with sex, sexuality, or some sexual identity complex thing. As for Yusuke, it seems everyone in the party is uncomfortable except for Teddy. In Persona 4, you fight villains or enemies in the Midnight Channel. They could kill you. Combined with the fact Shadow Kanji is this obnoxiously gay weirdo, it's a bit disconcerting to the average person. Unless you've watched the Mass Effect 3 ending and Picard Season 2 Episode 9, well then, nothing can never hurt your soul ever again. Kanji's sexuality is clearly coded as gay, but rather than accepting him the other characters see this as predatory and odd. As with all enemies, they are to be defeated, for Kanji to accept and understand however he chooses. Shadow Kanji is not real. He's a twisted version of what others think of Kanji that he created. And yes, he does sound predatory and odd, as any sexually flamboyant person would be, regardless of glowing eyes and superpowers. Perhaps too the bathhouse represents Kanji's own fears of homosexuality, again reflecting his own internalized homophobia. Maybe, but that's not what ends up happening. Kanji just accepts the fact he's going to be honest with himself now, has certain hobbies, and will stop running away. It ain't a matter of guys or chicks. I'm just scared shitless of being rejected. I'm a total pansy who tries to make everyone hate me. Oh, and he's attracted to the perfect girl. Kanji's cute radar is so strong, he could see past Naoto's disguise. He also likes animal crackers. That's it. I quit. This just ain't my thing. To hell with the exams. It's time for my animal crackers. Oh, can I have some too? I want to find the penguin. Hands off the penguin. It's mine. Sexuality is clearly perceived as something that can be cured and as long as he has these intrusive thoughts, the group must battle to save him somehow. <laughs> Ed then admits that Kanji isn't gay at all, because he isn't, and instead blames the writers for doing a bait and switch. Uh, Ed, that's not how writing works, or how it worked in the story. Ed also thinks that strength of the heart is admitting you're gay, even though Ed said Kanji wasn't gay. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. Uh, Ed then says this isn't strength at all, uh... Yeah, it is. It's called an arc. Accepting your weird, twisted self as a strength and knowing what it means, that's called knowledge. But it seems Ed wants this to be some homosexual reveal when he admitted it wasn't? The treatment of Kanji simply reveals a profound misunderstanding of what it means to come out. That's because it wasn't a coming out of closet story. It seems like Ed here is the one that's misunderstanding the message and using the dreaded head cannon. <laughs> Even worse, Kanji's acceptance is tied to misogyny. Girls are so loud and obnoxious, so, you know, I really don't like dealing with them, Kanji tells the group after the dungeon ordeal. I guess I wasn't really afraid of girls, I was just scared of people in general. Not one of the other characters pulls him up on his comment. That's because his statement isn't misogynistic. He literally just said he's scared of people in general. It's called anthropophobia. Finding girls loud and obnoxious doesn't mean he hates girls, considering he's attracted to Naoto and gets nosebleeds from looking at the girls in swimsuits. It means, and I quote, I really don't like dealing with them. The meaning is in the same sentence, sir. Is Ed suddenly blinded by his ideology and headcanon yet again? Or does he not know how sentences work? 
like from the horse's mouth? Well, my dear viewer, I'll let you figure out that one yourself. Now. Thank you.